we start again? Okay, yep. so we have Tobias <laughs> today, and he's, he's going to talk about mobile portation. Over yep. to you, Tobias. Good, I also like this much more. So hello again, and again, sorry, I know some of you have uh, listened to a similar presentation, uh, uh, maybe just over the last few days. I hope there is still something interesting uh, for you in there. So I want to talk about uh, uh, mobile portation, or in general, our research on uh, telepresence for mobile devices. So you have heard uh, Holger uh, and I, uh, uh, on Tuesday and I thought he gave quite a nice uh, introduction and basically almost a bit our view on telepresence and what presence means for us and how it uh, can be separated in spatial presence, uh, uh, co-presence and social presence. So I rely a bit on those basics because I'm, I'm, I now grew up a bit with this, with this school of thought and, and I will apply it basically to a mobile telepresence scenario. So how did it all start? So uh, as many of you uh, know, I'm originally from Germany. So and I moved to New Zealand in 2014 uh, to start at Otago. And uh, right back then I had a chat with Holger who was already working uh, on the topic of presence for ages. Um, that on this problem, this, this is where my family lives and this is where I live now in New Zealand. And if we can't do something about that you know, using basically mobile technology, because that was a, a topic I was working on before coming to New Zealand. So we wanted to compare or combine, actually, compare, combine uh, mobile computing uh, with the concept of, of telepresence uh, to solve this problem that maybe, that was always how I pitched it, that maybe uh, my parents can, can virtually join me here in my adventures in New Zealand. Often this, often this concept of this problem is actually, we call it often the, the, the sick grandma uh, uh, scenario, because even before COVID-19, it was always that my, for example, my grandma, that she couldn't come to New Zealand because probably sitting in a plane for 24 hours is a, is a bit too much for her. Yeah, so that was how it all started around 2014, 2015. And of course, uh, when we looked at technology back then, uh, there are other solutions available, like for example, even back then, Skype or nowadays Zoom, but also FaceTime on mobiles, as well as on desktop or normal computers, was a solution. So why not, why not use, for example, the computers or uh, use our mobile devices like back then? And one thing that we always uh, or identified first is it's, it's the lack of control for the, for the distant person. So basically I have control, I'm in charge of the camera, I control where I'm looking at, and that makes for the, for the other person, it creates the artificial distance. And um, also if you have listened to Holger's presentation from Tuesday, um, that, that control affects or, or uh, your, your feeling of uh, being present in that environment because you don't have control, you can't really look around. So that was something that we wanted to look into and this is what we identified as, as one of the many issues there. And there are a couple of solutions. So, um, or some other people have looked into that. Um, and I will not do a full related work a discussion here. I just want to give you a couple of ideas that are out there. One is, of course, that you can use robots, okay? Uh, if you've ever been to, to the Kai conference for, for years now, they had a few of these robots that are at the conference where you can uh, virtually rent a robot and, and basically attend a conference. And that also those also exist as a commercial solution. A bit in between, between a mobile solution and robot solution is, uh, what uh, Sven Kratz did with his uh, work on Poly. So it was basically just a robotic arm with a, with a mobile phone attached. And this allows you actually to just, the remote person to control that, uh, the mobile phone and the mobile phone's camera. So you have suddenly then camera control, but of course at the expense of carrying that, that robotic arm with you. There are also approaches, there's a very nice work, uh, approaches like Chile. So that was a very nice work. It was a, a, a Kai extended abstract in 2013. So that was an, uh, an approach that used a mobile device and it did not really give you view control, but it, what it was doing, it was spatially mapping the camera image. So imagine it like you're in an empty sphere and it was always showing the camera in this empty sphere, depending on the, on the sensor information of the gyro, for example, on the mobile phone. So you got a bit of spatial context, but you still couldn't freely look, uh, look around and see your environment. But we still thought that was quite a, quite a nice work. Of course, there are other approaches as well, like for example, uh, this is the really cool, I um, almost would say project theme uh, by Jung Rikimoto's theme. Uh, so there are a lot of work, so there's Jack in, um, this is live sphere, uh, I think there are also Jack in rooms. So there are, there are a couple of other projects along those lines. And what they did is they explored actually the usage of, of wearable devices that capture the environment 
but usually stream it and again to kind of VR headset or VR system. Uh, so here, for example, the one that where you use a, um, uh, uh, an AR headset with an integrated or your add-on camera, and that was streaming that all the information to a remote user who used the VR system even with, uh, with, hand, uh, with tracked uh, hands uh, basically stream it to a remote expert, yeah? So they were using a SLAM system and they, uh, they didn't really do a study, but I think it was still kind of a cool system. They later extended it to, to systems similar to this one where you wear uh, no glasses, but basically almost like a headband, which consists of several cameras and they stream it uh, to remote persons. And they used uh, one of those systems, for example, on the right-hand side, I think for the Tokyo Marathon, I'm not sure if, I don't think it was exactly this one. I think it was a bit more with rubber straps, um, but it, and, and someone, I'm not sure if it was Jun, but someone from the group ran a full, full, full marathon with it, which is kind of cool and shows uh, a nice idea. And of course, we all know that there are panoramic cameras. That was again from around 2014, 2015, the other versions, uh, but they're relatively expensive cameras, uh, uh, like the Google Jump. I mean, you need to afford, I think, 16 or almost 20 uh, uh, Google, uh, uh, GoPro cameras or Samsung Project Beyond. But there are cheaper ones like the LG or the Ricoh Theta is probably the most well-known one. But after looking into all the solutions, what we, for, for our research, uh, identified as the gap, there are no fully mobile solutions. So in the best case, they are mobile to desktop or robot to desktop. Uh, or wearable to desktop, but they are now what we said, uh, what we thought about symmetric solutions. So they are all asymmetric. Uh, so they always require that there is a, a power m machine in between, and um, and often they require this more custom hardware. But what we, for our specific uh, um, research, we were really interested in just utilizing basically off-the-shelf mobile phones. Um, uh, not because we think uh, they are better or this gives more sophisticated telepresence solution, but just because it's a specific niche and they are what we thought the closest to our current uh, communication, which is often on FaceTime, where we just use phones and to talk to each other. Yeah, so basically our idea was really just to use phones. So everything what you see from now on in our research is just phones. There are no desktop or powerful machines or server in between with a, with a very minimal exception. Uh, which is just the pairing of the communication partner. So basically just the exchange of the IP address. So the, the first thing what we were looked into that was um, into using Panorama. So uh, I just call it Panorama-based mobile telepresence. So that is a work that started in 2015, I think. I think it was end of 2014. So what was the general idea? You all have mobile phones, I think, uh, and you all know uh, how to uh, create a panorama with your mobile phone. So you just take your mobile phone and you rotate it around. And their initial idea was that we use something like this, but instead of computing that panorama on your phone, like shown here on the left-hand side, the idea was to show actually, uh, to send not the panorama, but actually the, the camera stream uh, to remote phone. So the idea is not you compute the panorama, but actually you send all the information for computing, required for computing the panorama to someone else. That's the basic idea. So we do that, we send the camera stream and we send an audio stream, and we just imagine that there is a, uh, a distant user and what's illustrated here. So over time, more, the more camera information you get, you build a panorama. And what this remote user or the ghost, so that's the someone who's far away from you, what he's doing or she's doing, they receive the audio information so we can talk to each other or both people can talk to each other. We share that live panorama. So it's not a static panorama, but always uh, the live camera stream is, is part of it. So the, the the center that, uh, or the, where the local user is looking at it, that's always updated in live. Uh, but they also what, uh, share what we show view information. So basically both of the phones are tracked. So we know spatially exactly where they are and we indicate this, with, it's a bit emphasized here with this red and blue boxes. So we always know where each other is, uh, uh, each user is looking at. And this is what we exchange and we exchange in real time. And back then for one of those projects, uh, it's here, it's just almost a bullet point. This is how do you establish the communication? And I think over the years, uh, several students uh, uh, almost lost their, their sanity and it cost us months. Uh, we used WebRTC basically as, a, as an implementation and uh, as a stack for, for all the, realizing all this communication. Um, we investigated many, many different approaches and we are still looking for, for something that is easier to handle, but we, we still came back to WebRTC because it's actively developed. 
which also has a lot of disadvantage if it's randomly updated, but a new set of the art codex for exchange in the video feed footage, for example, VP8 or VP9, which is actually more state of the art. So it has quite a good uh, uh, um, video compression. It's standardized and we use uh, Google's WebRTC library. Um, you can't see into the to the faces of the student who did actually the work, but but yeah, they they're still getting almost tears in their eyes. So it's it's not necessarily to deal with. Uh, it's not easy to deal with and cause a lot of pain. Um, and yeah, I can't praise them high enough for 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 dealing with it. Good. Uh, so basically everything what we do or show, everything what we show in the future so all uh, prototypes that you see they always use web rtcs and we use newer versions uh, uh, of that but we, we stayed with that okay um so what's the idea so how does that look like so so again the idea is someone is in place so this is our very good actor chris heinrich and he's using our app that we developed back then um and it looks like for him he's like he's creating a panorama but he's connected with a with a distant person uh, uh, via audio and everything what you're seeing here. So while he's creating the panorama, the whole footage is also sent to someone uh, uh, far away. So Chris here wants to share our beautiful University of Otago campus. So this is Jörg who was working back uh, then with us on that project. Imagine he's somewhere else. He receives the video footage and he's building his own version of a panorama of Chris environment. And now while we receive more and more information, he can now freely look around. And this gives him the independence that he can actually select the areas where he's interested in, look around. And again, you see this blue and this red frame. This is basically where each uh, communication partner is looking at, because now we basically, um, we disconnect them because they can look somewhere else. You also have to introduce some, you inter need to introduce some cues so that you show them where each one is looking at. Apart from these cues, what you, we also implemented other Things, for example, like very simple sketching interface, so you can not just talk, but also highlight, for example, objects. So you can say, for example, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the tower, and this is object. So very, very simple, but it's something that we integrated. Okay, and that was basically the first work that we then also published. That we did a lot of study. We did a very detailed a technical evaluation. That's something that we kept on doing as well as user study. So I will not go into, into too much detail, but basically something that we always investigated was latency. So latency can be very critical for telepresence application, in particular for these mobile applications, we were also interested in how, how, how much latency do we have. So here we usually say that we have a, a communication latency. So basically this is just getting the image here from A to B of roughly 400 to 500 milliseconds which is roughly in line with what WebRTC developers reported uh, for, uh, for their using their library. But when we really look at the end-to-end -end latency, which is not just getting the image from A to B, but actually it's capturing the frame transmission, so that was the communication, tracking and mapping the panorama and displaying the panorama, we have roughly between, so the minimum between 470 to 550 milliseconds. And that was for back then Nexus 5 phones, which are seriously outdated by nowadays standards, but this is what we used back then. So it was all into, implemented on Android. Maybe I should briefly mention that. Uh, but overall, this application was running in real time. Uh, it was implemented in several threads, so the application itself was very responsive. This panorama updating thread was running almost uh, in real time, so between 20 to 30 fra uh, frames per second. And usually we had this latency of 500 milliseconds, so just on a high level uh, here, some, some technical details. And we also ran a study. Uh, that was also uh, our first study uh, that we did with these mobile telepresence systems. And Paul got told you last time a lot about uh, spatial presence, co-presence, social presence. And we approached that whole thing from a, from a more explorative point of view. So we really evaluated all aspects. Um, and what we saw, uh, so we compared our approach against our approach, but without the panoramic function. And so it was basically exactly the same and behaved like our implementation of a Skype-based Skype interface. And we uh, saw that we can um, significantly improve the feeling of spatially present. So basically being there and uh, the feeling of uh, socially present. So the feeling, uh, the people said they have more the feeling of, of being together or actually being there together, uh, being, uh, sorry, being together. Yeah, so this is what we showed. And they, in general, they, they liked our interface uh, because there were also a couple of questions. Yeah. So we had to say that was a study where we had uh, people that tried once they shared 
uh, their, uh, their environments and once they receive the distant environment. So we, and we were evaluating both. So we are also evaluating uh, actually the person sharing the environment, which is actually something most of studies in our field on telepresence, they only consider the one receiving the distant environment. They don't ask actually questionnaires to the people sharing the environment, how much they feel the other person is with them, which is if you look for, for some interesting thing feel to look into i think there is more work needed there okay so this is just on a very high level how we started and uh, published that i think in 2016. Um, then uh, our master student jörg uh, left back to uh, join dieter schmasti group where he was also coming from and um, then luckily someone else took over or actually two people took over that was uh, matthew cook and, and jacob young who continued that project and they were looking at different aspects so, and the overall theme is actually that we started to explore um, different panoramic modes for tailored presence. And in the back, we spent a lot of time of actually almost re-engineering uh, this whole platform and make it more robust for our research. And again, a lot of blood and tears went into that that is often not visible in research papers. So, but one of the things what we, what we started to do is um, we also now consider that we maybe want to put our, uh, still our mobile phone into one of these, uh, I think we call the mobile VR headsets. So back then this was when the Daydream came out from Google and it was quite a, still is I think quite a comfy uh, headset, was relatively lightweight, at least compared to all these uh, Google Cardboard approaches. So we said now the receiver is maybe not just using the phone, this is what you see on the left hand side, but maybe also is putting the phone into one of these VR headsets. Okay, uh, that was one of the change that we considered. Because of that, we also considered that, for example, you might want to use your hands for interaction. Because basically, if you put the phone into a headset, um, oopsie, if you, yeah, if you put your phone into a headset, uh, then you can't use the touch screen. So you need different ways of interacting. And that was shown here, not in a headset so that we can see the screen. So basically we have this very simple pointing. Um, and then what we did is we investigated different panoramic modes and the effect of uh, our feeling present. So, and I, I will talk you through this different panoramic modes that we implemented. Uh, so the first mode is basically the simple Skype mode. Again, you just see the picture. And again, here maybe with your hand inside uh, but basically it's just a camera stream. So that means you don't have control. The next thing is basically very, uh, the next interface is very similar to that Chile interface. So basically, uh, if I should play the video, so we just show the camera image, but we spatially map it uh, to spherical environment. If you don't look where the local person is looking at, you see just this sphere, but it gives you better, that was our, our idea, it gives you better spatial understanding about the distant environment, yeah? Again, here basically we always see the uh, interface of the of the receiver of the distant environment. So our next approach was basically very similar to what we had before, even though we had now a, a nicer implementation of the panorama mapping that mapped it. Uh, but it's again now over time uh, uh, this uh, uh, a panorama is created. So that was basically also the the mode that we had previously uh, implemented. So you can now freely look around and if you uh, see areas where the panorama was mapped, then you see the panorama and if we don't have information, then we still see an empty complex sphere. Uh, but you also see at the beginning that we still, it's a live panorama. We call it a live panorama. So aspects of it are, are actually like a movie and update in real time. But then also what we considered, because at the same time these panoramic cameras came up, we also integrated the panoramic camera into our system. Again, this panoramic camera was attached to your mobile phone, so there's still no desktop computer, something involved. So the idea was that you maybe carry one of these panoramic cameras and, and you still want to uh, share this image with someone distant. And you can do it in two ways. The first way is you make a photo beforehand. So you have a static photo and we still use the mobile phone to update uh, that, that panorama. So basically in that blue, in that blue uh, uh, frame, this is live and the rest is the static panorama. So it was the assumption you make a static panorama and then you, you map in it the live video feed from your mobile phone, okay? And then the second mode was uh, you just transmit a full uh, a live panoramic feed. Because of the bandwidth that is required, actually what you, you can guess here a bit, but actually the resolution is a bit lower and this is just, just the trade-off if you try to get this large amount of information from A to B, okay? Good. And we, again, we did a technical evaluation from that. I will not go into too much detail, but just only 
uh, emphasize that for all these different modes, well, and in general for this kind of system, the biggest or what takes the most time is here highlighted in blue and, and yellow is actually using capturing the image, which is really slow on Android, um, and the network latency. So that's actually something that we observed beforehand. The rest can actually be done relatively quickly. Okay. Um, we just also, uh, I should say, we also did a, a present study, but, but I skipped this and referred to the paper here because I want to, uh, but I tell you a high level outcome maybe just for, for completeness. So the high level outcome was that actually, uh, it is actually for the feeling of spatial, spatial presence, is actually okay if you incrementally uh, um, uh, create a panorama uh, and it was received uh, uh, equally good as uh, transmitting a full panorama in real time, yeah? So, but then we did so much work in panoramas, we thought it's time to move on to something new. And um, that was the time when uh, Google started to, uh, to work a lot on this, uh, this, I think it was called Project Tango, basically on the Tango platform. So there were different prototypes. I know, for example, um, the people from the Hit Labs, I know they had uh, at least one or two of these devices. So that was prototypes of mobile phones with depth sensors, which were back then the, the first ones out there. So there was a mobile phone form factor and there was a tablet form factor. And what we used, we, we said we should look into that. That's quite interesting and incorporate in this our system. And we used basically the first commercial available and one of the very few commercially available uh, products that used the Project Tango uh, and that was the Lenovo Fab. So that's what you see here. And we integrate this and combine it with a panoramic camera. So what you see there is basically this standard Lenovo Fab, which is a phone with a, a depth camera. Uh, and we combine it in that case with our panoramic camera. And now we wanted to create a mobile uh, uh, application that is combining both. So how does it look? So just for the, for the depth camera part, so this is how it looks. So you basically, while moving around, we create a panoramic, uh, 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 sorry, we create a, a, a depth map here, a point cloud, and that is live streamed to your distant person. So while you build that cloud and it's refined, and this is what you see here, we immediately transmit it to the distant person. So the distant person also gets exactly this, this 3D model, okay? And we did this for indoor environments and, uh, we also did this for outdoor environments. And you see, it's actually not, not, not too, too slow here. So, so it's, uh, this, this point cloud uh, builds up uh, 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 quite quickly, okay? And again, was all streamed in real time using WebRTC uh, to someone else. So the next thing is, so now we have this 3D data, which is something that we didn't have before. Um, and we thought, we still have this panoramic camera. So what can we do with the panoramic camera? And we came up with something that I thought is, is uh, still a nice idea. Uh, and that was, we wanted to use a feature, we wanted to use an aspect of the panoramic camera that is normally annoying. And this is that you're always in the camera image. So most of the people, and I know many of you, you have worked with panorama cameras, is you put it on tripods or you put it on each head here so that you really just see the environment that you're not part of it. But we wanted to use that as a feature that the, the person in place is always uh, in the image. So what we did, uh, we implemented a face tracking on the panoramic image. And that's what you see here with Rosa, another amazing actor from our lab. Um, so basically she's moving uh, um, that prototype and basically we create an avatar and map uh, basically that portion of the, of the panorama uh, that shows her face because we have, of course, uh, a 360 panorama. So we need to find that area where you where you in. So we apply face tracking, which in itself is already quite challenging uh, because that image is quite distorted. Um, so and this allows us to create an avatar with that face. And now this allows us just combining those two things uh, to implement applications like this. So where you share in real time a 3D uh, a point cloud that is also extended, and both communication partners are represented with an avatar uh, as well as the avatar has basically uh, your face on. So also Rosa, who's, who's there, uh, uh, basically this other avatar, she would also see us uh, with our avatar uh, on, and, and our face mapped on this avatar, okay? And I think this is, this is already uh, uh, quite cool. And uh, in particular, if you consider that this is all implemented just using uh, mobile technology. Okay, so that's basically something that we could all have in our, in our pocket, okay? 
Uh, what we also did, and uh, I'm, I'm not telling so much about it, uh, we also implemented an interface that allows you to switch between uh, the panoramic mode and the 3D mode. Because the 3D mode, uh, usually the 3D model builds up over time, but while the panorama is always there, so you can transition between both of them, which is a kind of a, of a hybrid model. Um, but coming back to the 3D reconstruction, uh, we did this for heaps of example, and this why this video is slightly accelerated. I already showed you that can be relatively quick. So this is Jacob uh, 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 reconstructing uh, part of his houses, and we had lots of example where we create relatively large uh, point clouds that were again streamed uh, uh, to other parties. Uh, and of course, so just to give you an idea, uh, this is from Jacob's PhD thesis that he just recently uh, successfully defended. Um, so quick analysis of the, of the performance, depending on the size of the point scout, of course the performance goes down, but even when you see roughly 3 million uh, points, which is quite a large point scout, we still have uh, over 20 uh, frames per second, which is, which is quite good. Okay. Uh, and again, here, these are two examples you've seen before and how they were captured. This is basically, I think, the first and the second floor of your, of your house. And that was a model that we, uh, that we used or a scenario that we used for a user study using that system. So basically what we had, we had then Jacob inviting people uh, to his house. And we did this uh, uh, with actually just use, uh, and the other participants were here in the lab. So it's really something where, it, where we didn't do the study basically between two rooms, but it was really between uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, quite different locations. And again, we measured uh, all the different uh, 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 feeling of presence. And we compared here, uh, it's a bit blurry. Uh, we compared here a panoramic based approach between our mobile portation, which combines panoramic with depth. Um, but actually what we were only able to show that uh, was a significant improvement in, in social presence. So the, the feeling, the people had more the feeling of being together, but not necessarily, which was surprising for me, the feeling of being there together, which was initially a bit surprising. Yeah, because that was at least my hypothesis that, that I almost enforced to say, that's, that's my expectation. Yeah, that's what I, what I think uh, we likely to see or what. But actually, when looking back, that was not too surprising. Um, I would not say we, 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 didn't, we, made, we made a mistake, but this is one of the things that you maybe, when you studied, uh, when you design a study, you haven't fully thought through. Yeah? Sometimes then the, 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 the results show you something that you simply not have considered. So what we see here is actually a screenshot. So the left is actually the 3D aspect. Um, so you basically, you see the other avatar, uh, and the 3D world, and you see this other face. And on the right-hand side, it is actually this hybrid is a bit uh, of, um, but actually it's more the panoramic mode. So where you see actually panorama of the environment, you see a bit of 3D data, but you see still the, inter uh, the face of the other person. And um, I'm, I'm not sure, should I risk a question? So um, I'm not sure, it's, it's maybe a risky one, and, uh, but if you just see those two interfaces, so the right one would be the panoramic mode and the left hand one would be the 3D mode, would you have an idea uh, why this explains that the people do not feel co-present? Like being there together, like for here or also for the people who are, who are away, just, just unmute your microphone if you have an idea. Or in the room. Or in the room. I mean, one, at least one person is excluded. Maybe you, would you have an idea why the people, somehow for the panorama, they felt more like being together, uh, being there together. Why is that? Or why we think is that? Um, uh, I don't know, I suppose with the, the 3D view, um, it's less realistic, like you're missing a lot of the scene. So maybe it doesn't seem like you're really there. You don't, okay, so you say you do, okay, yeah. One aspect. We, we, had a, we had a different idea why this could be. Um, probably in the panoramic, you're always seeing person, whereas in the other one, you're not always seeing them because you can go up in your own tree, but you're on mute. 
Yeah, so I'm not sure if it was uh, uh, if everyone heard that. So basically, what we uh, but this is actually what we thought. So actually, we we have not considered that actually in the 3D world we're almost actively promoting that the people go their own way and and really explore it freely. So they're not so much together because they can all go their own way. While in the panoramic mode, is actually you always see. Uh, that that headshot of the other person while in the in the 3d mode you always see you only see basically the other person if you if you are close to the avatar and directly looking at the avatar so basically and this is our hypothesis again uh, that needs further research but basically uh, giving basically the people more freedom might also uh, uh, um, um, how should I say, decrease their feeling of feeling co-present because they just go their own way, yeah, while exactly, uh, in, instead of exactly force them together. And this it needs a bit more research, so that was something that we thought and, and seriously have not considered, uh, and it's something to, to maybe also consider and explore in, in, in future uh, telepresence application, in particular if they support this freely. Uh, good, so let's just move on. Um, and the last uh, project I want to talk about is actually a project um, that we also did uh, just very recently, and it was actually with uh, collaborators together in Graz. And, but it nicely connects uh, with, the, uh, with the project from Jacob. So just looking back um, to the points clouds we created, so this is again this video which I showed you beforehand, so the point cloud, we see uh, that this is still low fidelity, and we are aware of that. Yeah, it's point clouds. We discussed for a long time also actually uh, creating a mesh from that, but actually we thought that the mesh was actually worse than a point cloud. Yeah, but nevertheless, it's both not perfect and it's both low fidelity. And there are algorithms like, for example, Kinect Fusion or Structure from Motion approaches that can take a lot of depth data or can create depth data from images. Uh, but even they, they often, uh, if you apply them, they often result in objects like this. And this is because uh, often these approaches, they cannot recover this depth data because of the characteristics and the surfaces of the objects. So what we see here is actually, uh, it's a machinery and it's, it's quite shiny. And then basically this image-based reconstructions, uh, they do not work, okay? And, and also if you have depth sensors, they usually struggle with certain surfaces. Okay, so that is the problem, and that was a problem that was uh, identified by Dennis and Peter Moore, his PhD student, and um, yeah, and we started to collaborate on that. Um, and that, just to show you a couple of other problematic surfaces, because they approached it also, again, from a mobile telepresence application, having, uh, or having a mobile telepresence application in mind, but they come also from an industrial background. So they wanted to, to reconstruct or create basically depth information like our point clouds from, from lots of objects. Again, shiny objects, but also translucent objects or relatively complex objects. And all those objects that you can see here, they are all extremely hard to reconstruct, if not impossible. Yeah, I will uh, show you some examples soon. So again, their, their idea was that we use a mobile telepresence system uh, consisting of a local worker and a remote expert, and they should support each other through that mobile telepresence system. So they required the local worker to create a 3D representation, very similar to, to our work before. We wanted to share a, a 3D model of the environment, and here the 3D model was usually more objects. Yeah, we were not so much interested in rooms, but more the objects within the rooms. Yeah, send it to a remote expert, and he or she can then provide uh, expertise or additional information. Okay, and the idea was here that we wanted to use uh, light fields. Uh, because of time reasons, I can't uh, uh, give a very detailed uh, introduction into light fields here. That could be a lecture on its own. But basically, think about a light field as a, as a representation, three-dimensional representation of a different uh, distant environment or of environment, but it's not a 3D model. It's just think about it as a database of spatially registered images and you can interpolate between these images in very smart ways and generate new images. So, and this is what you see on the right-hand side so that you have the feeling you're like you're interacting with a 3D model, okay? So you can freely look around. Um, so basically there are four input images and, and uh, a light field which is generated of those images, but also more, okay? The advantage is we get really a high quality, almost photorealistic representation of the environment. Um, 
which is independent of the object of interest. So here, a translucent example, but even if it's shiny, as long as you can make a photo from it, just so as long as you have light, you can create a light field. Okay, the disadvantage normally is you don't have depth data, which is really bad for, 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 play, for example, placing annotations. Uh, there are no interfaces for creating or annotating light fields, and usually they're extremely large. So there have been uh, large, so light fields have not been considered for many really interactive applications or telepresence applications. And this is what we wanted to change. So the idea, and I will just briefly go through the main steps. So the first is, the first idea is that we need to create a light field and we only want to create a small light field of the areas of interest. So the first thing is that the a remote expert guides a local worker and say, this is the part uh, you need to capture for me so that I can help you. So how does that look like? So the local worker is making a picture, this is what you see here, and sends it uh, to, the, to the remote expert. Yeah, so it's just a picture, sends it to the remote expert. The remote expert sees that picture and says, no, if I should help you, then you need to go around and capture this whole object from a different side. Yeah, so, and this you can graphically uh, represent or provide graphical cues as well, of course, you also connect it via audio as well. So that's what you see here. Yeah, so basically just make a photo from the other side. Then once they identify, they can go back and forth a couple of times if needed, but if they are at the right position, the interface changes and now it gives you actually some uh, a visual indication of where to move your phone. And the phone is now capturing a lot of photos. Okay, so we basically just um, uh, uh, capture uh, here a, a, a spherical uh, light field. So, okay, that's again what the lo local worker is seeing. So, and you see him on the right hand side on the inset uh, performing the task on that object, and it's relatively quick. And all of this information is now sent to a remote expert, and the remote expert can now see. Uh, this relatively high fidelity uh, graphical representation of that environment, which always feels like 3D. You see a bit that there are some interpolation artifacts at the corner, but you can interactively navigate there. And once you need specific, uh, and that's already quite cool because again, if you use an approach not using light fields, this is how it would look like if you use traditional reconstruction approaches. Yeah. So again, we use that standard implementation of Kinect Fusion. Uh, um, and other reconstruction approaches and you, in the best case, you get something very almost like foam looking mushy things, okay? Because of the characteristics. So, and you see in the light field in the upper, upper right hand corner and I hope you agree all with me that this is a way better representation. And the last step uh, where we were working a lot of time, which is really complicated with light fields is how to annotate them. So we created an interface uh, and I will not go into too much detail, which allows you to actually recover from a light field depth data because there are no depth data, but basically as we allow you, you click into a light field and we can basically try for not a real reconstruction, but basically we can still recover some depth data, which allows you to place annotation uh, in that light field. And this is what you see here. So basically the remote expert is then putting some annotations, for example, on the machinery or here uh, that can then so that is, yep, yeah, so this is the interface for placing new annotations or recovering the depth, and now you can draw arrows. And this is then, again, transmitted, and this is what you see here, to the local worker. So the local worker uses an AR or mixed reality interface and sees now the annotation and can now, can, for example, assemble um, uh, certain pieces accordingly. Yeah, so that's the system what we created. We, again, we did a, a study on that. We didn't focus on that one on the presence, but just on the general usability. Uh, and the quality of the light field, then we showed, I refer that to the paper that we can drastically uh, improve that. And that brings me a bit faster than expected, which is not necessarily a bad thing, so we have more time than for questions. Uh, that brings me uh, to the end. So in summary, it was actually a good exercise for me because basically uh, what I presented to you was actually almost like five years of work with uh, different, uh, extremely, uh, uh, capable PhD students uh, and master students. And it was for me uh, actually the first time that I uh, did a presentation uh, on a recap of this five years' work. So what we showed you is different approaches, just utilizing mobile uh, devices, mobile phones, and I think that's the key of our research, and to use them for exploring telepresence, uh, mobile telepresence approaches. So the idea is that you really have just a mobile phone uh, both people just have a mobile phone. They can uh, directly communicate to each other. And the first key idea was to uh, give uh, free um, 
uh, control of your point of, not point of view, but uh, where you look around. So view control using panoramas. We later extended this to even uh, three-dimensional point clouds and the most recent works as a collaboration uh, uh, with Dennis Kalkhofen's group and Graz was also to explore light fields to increase the visual fidelity. But again, also this one was just using mobile devices. So there is really no server or, or any computation done on a, on a powerful machine. Yeah. So let's finish it. And now I'm open for any kind of questions. Thank you.